Hi, it's Andy Hoffman again, media director at Miles Franklin. Uh, I have a special guest on my weekly audio blog, which we are taping an hour before the close on uh, Friday, November 1st. Uh, basically, since I shifted my entire liquid net worth into the PM sector in 2002, David Morgan has been one of the world's most respected silver experts. I briefly said hello to him around 2006 and finally spent some quality time with him at last year's uh, or this year's Liberty Mastermind Symposium in Dallas. It's my pleasure to have him as a guest on this week's audio blog where we will discuss numerous aspects of the silver market. How are you doing, David? I'm doing quite well, Andy. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, let's uh, just quickly go over the week's main events before we get into the more important topics of uh, your views on silver supply and demand. Obviously, with all the noise around, I mean, there's been terrible economic news across the board, and not just here, but in, uh, in, in Asia and Europe. And of course, Wednesday afternoon, the Fed announced, as we expected, no tapering. Uh, and, and of course, at the same time, we had the COMEX option expiration date, and yesterday was the first delivery date. So there was a lot of things going on. Uh, David, what's your view about tapering? Can the Fed ever taper? And why do you think silver and gold were attacked right after the announcement, despite it being so bullish? Well, the question, you know, could the Fed taper? I mean, could or would are two different words. Could it? Yes, it could. Would it? I doubt it. I mean, there's the idea that they were going to taper, just the idea that they would do it, sent the uh, stock market reeling, and a lot of markets reeling. There's so much uh, addicted uh, financial markets to the low zero interest rate policy and this, this uh, <clears throat> $85 billion per month that the Fed is pouring into the markets to buy up uh, assets that are hardly assets on the balance sheets of these banks and mortgage companies. And, and it's not only here, it's also other places, although that's something they don't really discuss in the openly. So could they? Yeah. Would they? I doubt it. Uh, if they do, um, I think it would be under, I, I don't know what it would be. I mean, we could discuss it further, but my, my idea is this, if they were to taper, the markets would probably start really, and it'll make them look bad. So I think Bernanke, when he sidestepped the issue recently, made a very good statement politically. And what he said was, you know, I don't know now when we're going to taper. We will taper based on the data. And he was somewhat specific on the data. He was targeting like the unemployment rate. So they have a lot of leeway. And what you have to remember on top of that is that Bernanke is a hawk compared to Yellen. Yellen doesn't believe that there's such a thing as inflation. Yeah, Yellen is is on the record as saying that she would gladly get rid of the uh, dual, the mandate of controlling inflation if she could get unemployment to go down, which is absolutely insane given the definition of a central bank. And uh, I think uh, my listeners uh, know that I believe as well that tapering is is utterly impossible. Uh, because any time that rates, uh, any time that there's even talk of it, rates go up. And look what's happened to the economy just since the interest rates uh, ticked up marginally in the last few months. Right. So I, I think we can move on. But yeah, I agree with you. And this thing with Yellen, I mean, I know I'm continuing, but it, it concerns me, uh, you know, for the economy. But I mean, I, in, a, in a way, I want to be fair. And it doesn't matter really who's in there because. There's so much momentum in the system, and the system is so broken right now that even a Paul Volcker at the head that definitely had, uh, uh, let's say, some uh, ability to do things that were certainly not beneficial to the majority, uh, even he, I don't think, could do anything worthwhile at this point. Not that I agreed with his policies, by the way. All I'm stating is that mm -hmm. he went in there, and no one else could probably ever at the head of the Fed had the... Uh, had what it took, so to speak, to right. do what he did in 1980. Right, the supposed uh, Uber hawk, of course, in 1980, he had the ability to do that because we didn't have an addiction to uh, to um, to cheap money. And uh, the way I put it in my writings is that you could put Jesus Christ or Superman in charge of the Fed and he couldn't fix things right now. But, no, uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, uh, you know, on to the second part of the question, again, 
as I mentioned, Tuesday was the Comex uh, op October auctions expiration, and Thursday was first delivery day, so it was kind of sandwiching this. And and uh, as we know, the uh, the the registered inventories of both gold and silver are are at their record lows. So how much of uh, how much of this attack uh, that we've seen since the second the, uh, the FOMC announcement uh, do you believe is due to possible fears of a default because there were so many in the money contracts. And I know this is a bit esoteric, but I just, would, you know, I think the listeners would like to hear your views. Okay. Well, presuppose there's an attack and I'll go along with that because, you know, the market is definitely manipulated. I'm a little bit in the middle. I mean, what I, what I've stated and I want all the listeners to know, because many people say, well, if this, you know, if it is manipulated and even David Morgan says so, or, someone's Ted Butler or whomever, pick your favorite, you know, gold or silver guy, then why should I bother being in the market? And my stance is very clear. The overall trend can't be manipulated. It, uh, now, it can be for, you know, at times and for durations, uh, but the overall trend. So my point is that the bull market and gold lasts like 11 consecutive years. And manipulated or not, it's really normal market activity to see some kind of sell-offs or some kind of backing and filling before you move up. Uh, not to excuse the fact that this certainly is whack at times, I and mean, it's ridiculous to think that it's not manipulated when you see, for example, uh, three quarters of a year's worth of silver production go off in a you know matter of seconds and, and, you know, on the COMEX. I mean, this is preposterous to say that's not manipulation. Of course it is. But again, my point is that paper doesn't equal physical. And we're winning that battle, meaning the physical buyers. It just may not appear to be winning basis the price action. But the price action is reflective of paper, not physical. So I know, and, and now people are going to say, well, what does that mean? So let me explain. What that means is that we're getting a gift right now and that you are buying gold and silver pretty much at the cost of production. So now I've kind of lost uh, the question. I'm sorry. Andy. No, no, no. Oh, you've, yeah. said, you've said it correct. You've said you've answered it uh, completely. In fact, you know, basically you start out by uh, summarizing what Richard Russell said, you know, when I first read him 10 years ago about you can't stop the primary trend. And, and frankly, they haven't been able to stop the primary trend in any meaningful way until this year. We've seen uh, just utter ridiculousness in the uh, in the suppression. And that's why we're seeing this record low amount of registered inventory. There's only a billion dollars worth of gold and silver on the COMEX, if you believe their numbers, which is not that much. And I, personally, I believe that, that that fear of that imminent default is what's triggering uh, so much of these attacks because there's just not that much physical out there. All you have to do is look at, you know, the Chinese demand, for instance, and, you know, we'll see what happens. But the, the more they attack, uh, and we'll get into this in a second here, the more they're going to make uh, it more attractive to buy around the world. Uh, so anyway, uh, let's move away from current events per se, as in very current events, and let's ask uh, the silver guru, as his uh, moniker is, and by the way, I didn't uh, tell people he'll say it after, it's silver-investor.com is David's uh, website. Let's ask him some questions about silver demand and supply, because frankly, I don't think there's more than a handful of people on earth uh, who can answer these questions better. So let's see, let's start with demand. Here's a question that, uh, that even I am baffled at. I have some theories about it, but I'd love to hear yours. Uh, I think everyone by now realizes that the U.S. Mint's Silver Eagle sales are not just headed for a record year. They're, they're going to blow away the 2011 record. And this during a year where physical silver price, or I should say paper silver prices, are down 25 plus percent. Now, uh, my, my view is that this has to be coming from overseas because uh, working for one of the largest bullion dealers, since roughly mid-May, business has been very, very slow. Uh, so, David, what do you think all that, where do you think all this uh, buying is coming from in the U.S. Mint? Uh, that's a great question. To be totally honest, I don't know for sure, but I agree with you, Andy. I think, I do know for a fact what you said is true, which is that the Silver Eagle is the most coveted coin outside of the borders of the U.S. And demand for silver outside of U.S. borders has increased over the years. It's certainly not compatible with gold, even though you might hear that. The only place it really is compatible with gold or close to gold is India, 
And it makes me laugh when people start talking about, well, you know, they've got these taxes on the Indian population, so they're not buying as much gold, so now they're going to silver. Silver has been the story of India for eons. Uh, it's only in the recent times, like the last decade, where the population at large has been uh, wealthy enough to be able to afford gold over silver. So certainly they love gold. I'm not stating that they don't understand this, but they've always been silver investors. And again, now that they're putting uh, restrictions, you could say, on the gold, there's, they're moving back into the silver market. But I think that's the best I could offer. I know that there's uh, a lot of demand for eagles. I get that question from a lot of our foreign subscribers. I mean, the Morgan Report's translated in the Chinese, it's translated in the French, and it's translated in the German. Uh, we have English readers, of course, worldwide. I get letters from like Japan or some in South America or whatever. And invariably, over the years, this isn't like in the last month, but over the years, they've asked, you know, where can I get Silver Eagle? So it is very popular outside the U.S. borders, as you stated. Okay, well, that leads right into what I have here as 2B on my uh, silver demand questions. Uh, as for gold, I recommend that uh, everyone listening should Google 60 Minutes India's Love Affair with Gold. There's a piece that came out about a year or two ago. I mean, the Indians do think of uh, wealth in terms of real items of value, not in terms of rupees. And uh, and as you say, the demand has not been affected in silver despite the imports. Um, and, and in fact, here's my question. I see that actually the Indian imports this year are headed for a record. And, uh, you know, despite all the talk about the uh, import tariffs on gold, they actually have made steep tariffs on silver as well. Uh, so is your view these, day, these days that, that the Indian uh, people are simply just flooding into the uh, silver market more so than usual because, you know, gold has just become too expensive? Uh, partly. I mean, gold is, you know, we both know that gold and silver are both off from their highs and it's been, you know, a couple of years it's been all pushing toward three for silver and uh, two for gold. Gold was September, so, you know, two years and a couple months. But that's partly it. I think, uh, the, I think the Indian population is more accustomed to this, quote, unquote, I'm using quotations, restrictive policy on silver because they have such an appetite for silver. And again, for eons, that uh, they kind of just, I guess, are conditioned to it on the silver side, whereas gold is kind of a new thing. And so, you know, there's been a little bit of shift to silver because of that, I think. At least that's what the data seems to indicate. But I think in both cases, most of them either get it, you know, off the, off the black market or the true free market. They get it either smuggled or not, or they just, and, that, and this is the vast majority, they just suck it up and say, okay, you know, it's worth it. I would still rather pay the premium and hold real stuff than this rupee that's being uh, inflated to infinity. And so, you know, one way or another, the effort to slow it down is actually working in reverse. Yeah. People that say, oh, it's restricted now to own gold. Oh, I wonder why they're restricting it. I better go get some. Yeah, yep. Just human nature 101. Uh, and, you know, the way I've, I've talked about India, it's almost like apartheid in South Africa where you had a small minority of white people ruling a large majority of black people. There you have a small minority of paper-loving central bankers uh, making policy for a billion people that think in terms of real money. Um, so, and as you know, the black market is very strong and the premiums are very high. So I think that and anything the government does over there is only going to backfire them in the, in the long term. Uh, but I really wanted to move next on to China, to Chinese silver uh, supply and demand because it's so opaque. I mean, yes, they report how much silver they produce and presumably they, they purchase every ounce the government does, but there's not a lot of official data out there. And, and honestly, when I went to China this summer, I was there in, in early August, I was in the, the, uh, the shops and there was tons and tons of people buying gold, but I don't recall that much silver out there, uh, in the stores at least. And I'm just trying to get your views of, uh, you know, are there any numbers out there about Chinese silver demand or you know, what, how do people view silver there compared to gold? Well, the Silver Institute puts a little bit of uh, data together on uh, Chinese silver demand. 
But I'll give you my take. And I was there as well, Andy, but not uh, much earlier than you. But, you know, recently, meaning within the last decade. So that's recent for me. Within this bull market, that's what I want to make clear. So, one, you're correct. Uh, when I was there, there was like very little. In fact, I kept asking, uh, you know, where can I buy silver? About the only thing I could find to buy was like silver chopsticks. <laughs> and even, even that took some effort. It has loosened up, and there are a few shops that feature silver and silver coins and silver bars and that type of thing. But uh, there was a video on the Internet. I forget how many years ago now. It's been a while. And it was basically a promotional ad about silver's cheaper than gold. And there was a big shop, a uh, coin dealer, you could say, coin, coin bullion dealer in China that made this video. And for some reason, it got misconstrued that this was a government <laughs> edict to go out and buy silver. No government is going to tell their people to go buy precious metals, even the Chinese. It's in their culture. They know it, if they have the ability to it. But China's mostly gold-focused uh, investment-wise. Industrial-wise, China is extremely focused on silver. Number one, point one, at one point, they were uh, exporting uh, something along 100 million ounces a year. Now they import 100 million ounces a year. A uh, second point, they are responsible for almost all of the photovoltaics, the, the uh, solar panels. And I'll pause there because, Andy, one of the biggest newer demands on silver has been solar. It has been growing very rapidly up until the last year and a half or so. And at that point, it's pretty much leveled off. And the reason being is that solar really isn't that efficient. I mean, you are better off as far as amount of money paid for energy output to use oil, coal, or some other source. But there have been mandates, especially in Germany, to buy solar panels. And it was subsidized by the government, so it would make it more or less on par, where if you spend X amount of dollars, you get so much power out. This has really tapered off most of, you know, since the world is basically broke, uh, that subsidy has been taken away. So the demand for solar is flat and maybe decreasing. Uh, in fact, I got a little bit of a notation in the latest Morgan report that we posted this weekend. Uh, one of our members went and attended the Silver Institute uh, Silver Summit, I'll call it. It wasn't called Summit, the Silver Conference. Uh, near Washington, D.C. Uh, it was just a couple days ahead of the Silver Summit in Spokane. I couldn't do both. But he said that a lot of the uh, pres presenters stated that solar is pretty much on the decline or flat to declining. And I can't argue that. I mean, I want to be objective and factual. They've decreased the margins, and they're using this thin film. And you can look all this stuff up on Google if you're really that interested. Mm -hmm. But basically, like any industry, you're going to maximize your efficiency in that industry, and solar is no different than anywhere else. But the point being that China never mined enough silver for their own needs, let alone what the world's demanded for certain products. So they don't export any silver. They import a great deal of silver smelted in China. And when I was there, they seemed to me to be far more interested in silver than gold. And the number one question to me on the silver supply demand scene as bizarre as it may sound, Andy, was how do you recycle 100% of the silver that you use? I mean, they do not waste things in China. This is, you know, well over a billion population, a great deal of it really, really poor. That's changed significantly over the last decade or so. Nonetheless, they are of an attitude of, of extreme frugality. And they, again, just thought, you know, every time that you use silver in a product, once that product is discontinued or superseded by a better version or whatever. How do you retrieve the silver? That was really something that they were most concerned about. So again, they don't look at it in, in China as money in our generation. If you go back and study the silver history, hugely important. So China was the last to be in the silver standard. And they were very affected by the Anglo-American axis uh, the Anglo-American Empire, I'll call it. And if you really want to study that, and it's fascinating, uh, go to my website. This part's for free. And look up anything by Charles Savoy. 
but you'd have to dig through the archives. But if you start to look at what was going on during the open wars and what happened at the final stages of the last to be on the silver standard, what happened to China under the silver standard, it's again, a fascinating story. Well, so yeah. the point being at one time, they, China, was more uh, concerned about silver as money than anybody. But right. that unfortunately hasn't stayed in their DNA like it has in India. And I don't know the reason for that. Well, regarding the uh, industrial stuff, I'm going to ask you some uh, further questions in a moment. And, and I don't blame them. They're very industrious people for trying to, uh, let's call it, create alchemy to get more silver out. I mean, uh, everyone's going to try this as the price goes up to get more silver recycled. And, and uh, certainly they will more than any. And, uh, you know, the, the higher the price goes, the more they're going to try. And uh, just to make one note to readers, when, when uh, David, you're referring to the Chinese, no government would promote the purchase of precious metals. I think uh, indirectly, the Chinese government has promoted by loosening standards over the last decade or so uh, that allowed the people to buy them. Uh, they may not have, have purposely uh, made campaigns, but uh, I do believe that they have they are trying to get as much precious metals into the country one way or the other. Would you agree? Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I, I'm glad you made that notation. I mean, it's not like they, if anyone is, if any government has, has implied you should own it, China is the one. Right. Uh, as far as, to the best of my knowledge. Oh, but last thing I forgot, and I want to make it clear. On the silver side for investment purposes, you know, I have friends in China. I have a, a gentleman that, that did a report for us that lives in China and told us about investment demand. So, you know, I know a fair amount about it. doesn't mean I know a lot because I don't live there. But, you know, this trans, this, uh, this uh, relationship I have with this guy he does. A lot of the silver buying that does take place in China is in the banking system and is paper silver. So, and I think it's important for mm -hmm. your listeners, your readers to know that that was not something I, I wanted to see or hear about, but that's the fact. You know, again, I want to be objective. I want to be a truth teller. So a lot of it is, you know, well, it's bulky if you're going to buy, you know, and some of these people in China are very wealthy and a lot of people have gained in, in wealth. And so, you know, many people have the, the same question, wherever they are. Well, it's valuable. Where do I put it? I don't want it in my house. I don't, you know, where do I put it? So the banks, just no problem. Sign this form. Here's you know, your silver safe here. So yeah. again, that upsets me because I'm like you, you know, if you don't like Mike Maloney, a lot of us, if you don't hold it, you don't own it. But nonetheless, a lot of the quote unquote silver investment, and I'm not saying it's not there. It's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that it's a paper silver trade and therefore we don't know what the actual existence is. Well, that's an interesting uh, uh, thought. But the fact is we all know that that around the world, there are just tons and tons of people who don't understand the difference between paper and physical. And, you know, for us to generalize that, well, all the Chinese know when, you know, most of them aren't even educated or many aren't educated, uh, certainly not about precious metals, which haven't even, you know, which weren't, you weren't allowed to buy them until only very recently would be, be naive. So uh, there are plenty of Chinese people that need to learn uh, what, what we're trying to teach as well. So in, in some way, I think that's a positive. Um, next question, I have two more questions on demand. This one uh, is relatively brief. Generally speaking, what percentage of the monetary silver demand do you believe emanates from the Eastern Hemisphere versus the West? And in a way, I think that dovetails with my original question about who might be buying the, the mint uh, eagle sales, because I think people in the United States are very secular. They think, oh, well, America is buying everything. But as we know, uh, in the precious metals world, in the physical world, they're, they're not a large part uh, in the big scheme of things. What do you think the West-East split is on monetary demand for silver? Well, that's a great question. I'd probably look it up and get you a better answer, but off the top of my head, I would say it's probably 70, 30. I'd say 70% is probably North America, could be even 80. And the other 20 or 30% is the rest of the world. They just have not caught on to silver as an investment like they have gold. But I think that is something that's in our favor. And I think that's one of the primary reasons you'll see silver overshoot gold on a percentage basis. Because once gold gets priced out of the average person's ability to buy it, uh, you will see a lot of people rush to silver. And once they start studying it and they see, oh my goodness, silver is you know, not, only an invest not only a monetary metal, it's an industrial metal, there's less above ground supply and investment form, and on and on as the story goes, there'll be an even bigger rush into it. So... I really think, Andy, as bizarre as this sounds, and I've made the statement before and I believe it, does it make it true because I believe it, 
is that this time you're going to not, there will be instances where you will not be able to get physical mileage. And what I mean by that is during the financial unraveling, uh, a couple of things could happen. One is the supply is so, so tight that you just can't get it. I mean, you might be able to get a few coins here and there, but you know, for Eric Sprott to come in and buy 20 million ounces of silver in one swoop, that's going to be impossible. Second point is as the financial unwinding happens, it could get to a point where, you know, the Mike Maloney's, the Miles Franklin's, the, uh, you know, Dylan Gages, name it, says, I'm not selling this stuff. I see what's happening out there in the financial markets. I'm holding the bullion we have. Right. We're not, we're closing shop. I know that sounds extreme, but folks, we're living in very extreme times. Not extreme at all. I mean, we've seen uh, in the past five years, multiple instances of shortages. Uh, of course, the most uh, famous one is what happened in 2008 when you had 100% premiums on silver. But we also had in 2011 when silver went up to $50 an ounce. We had earlier this year, the mint shut down for, uh, for, for I think, two weeks. And that was not even during a crisis. So, of course, we're going to see those shortages. And uh, it could be industrial demand and uh, monetary demand that contribute. But obviously, monetary demand is likely going to be the bigger factor. Uh, my last quest question on silver demand is, is the industrial part, and I don't want to go too deep into it, but generally speaking, if you could just let the listeners know what percentage of the, uh, the current mine uh, production uh, is taken out by, by uh, industrial demand worldwide, and you know, do you think that percentage is going to change much, you know, aside from a, you know, a major monetary crisis? Right. Okay, the industrial demand is roughly 50% of the total silver supply. And so listen to my words carefully, total silver supply. The silver supply consists of two main components, the, the, mine, the mine supply, the annual mine production, and the annual recycled production. So depending on whose study you use, you can all use the most uh, bearish one. You have roughly 800 million ounces mined and you have about 200 plus million ounces um, recycled annually, so you have roughly a billion ounces, and the other studies less than that, but we'll round it up to a billion ounces. Of that total, 50, more than 50% is industrial demand year over year, so that's 500 million ounces. Uh, and do I think that there'll be much of a change in the industrial demand? The answer is no. I really don't. There's so many things that silver cannot, and there's no substitute for silver. It's the lowest economic cost. I mean, the reason that you go into business in capitalism, which is what a big concept, we should have some, excuse me, mm -hmm. um, is that you want to profit. And so if you're going to make something of value, you're going to use the best you can at the lowest cost as long as it provides the function that it needs. Well, silver fills that role. I mean, for example, there's substitutes for silver. You can use gold platinum or palladium in some instances, but all those three metals cost far more than silver does. Uh, you could substitute copper in some instances, but you wouldn't get the functionality. I mean, if you, every place that you have in a cell phone that uses silver, you use copper, the reliability would be much less and therefore you'd be out of business. So yeah, you could squeeze the margins and yes, you can try your best to squeeze it down, meaning use less silver per application or perhaps a substitute. I mean, this graphene thing is pretty interesting, and it may be substituted for silver, but again, it's, in, it's economics. How much does it cost for graphene? Is it cheaper than silver or isn't it? So lots of reasons that there will be, I think, demand that will be at least where we're at now going into the, into the future. It may not be for the same applications, but because of silver's properties of being the best reflector of light, the best conductor of heat, you're going to see it used more and more. And we haven't even talked about nanotechnology, which wouldn't be a large demand because we're talking nanoparticles, but it seems that silver, again, with the properties that it has, somehow or other, is going to be very instrumental in a lot of the nanotechnology applications as well. Yeah, that's that's been the key with silver demand is that it's it has indispensable properties. I mean, years back uh, when people stopped using uh, regular photography, they thought that would be the end of demand. And here we are a few years later and the demand is actually higher because they keep finding new uses for it. So even without uh, the, the knowledge that you have, my suspicion is that uh, there's not going to be a dramatic change in uh, industrial demand in the, at least in the, the coming few years. Who knows what we'll look at, you know, 10 or 20 years down the line. 
Um, I just wanted to finish with a couple of questions on supply, uh, which I know that, uh, that you have some very strong um, opinions on and, and knowledge, starting with how much silver is actually out there. And, you know, the numbers out there are, you know, a billion to a billion and a half ounces of silver above ground worldwide. Of course, a lot of that is sitting in people's vaults, never to see the light of day. How much do you really believe is out there that could be uh, purchased uh, anywhere near these prices? Oh, that's a great question. All right. So what we really are asking is to be specific. And you asked it great, Andy. I, I really respect you. And it's just a joy to see you working with uh, my friends at Miles Franklin. But um, so how much investment grade silver is out there? That's really the question. We're not worried about a silver tea set or silverware or silver chain or anything like that. Not that you can't, you know, get a silver chain into the scrap supply. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is until that chain is refined, you really don't count it as investment grade silver. So there's really two classes of investment grade silver. There's the bullion supply, which is basically your thousand ounce bars, which is your commercial bar activity. And a lot of that is held for investment purposes now where if you go back a decade, very little of that was held for investment purposes. And the other side of the silver investment is coin supply. And coin supply is American Eagles, it's silver rounds, it's silver small bars, like five ounce or 10 ounce bars. And you can throw 100 ounce bars in there or you can move that into the bullion category, it doesn't really matter. So if you look at the coin category, all coins worldwide that's above ground, there's roughly a billion ounces. And if you look at the bullion supply, which is your thousand ounce bars, it's roughly the same. So even though you always hear the number of billion, that's referring to the bullion side only, which is the most important side, I believe, because the reason being is that a thousand ounce bar for the big players is like hundred ounce bars to, you know, a fairly well off middle class or upper middle class person in the United States. In other words, thousand ounce bars are just a way of counting the amount of silver you own for the Eric Sprott's of the world, for example, and it's held for investment. It's also a commercial bar, but it's investment activity. So the total number, and I'm being generous here, is probably two billion, but the most important question that you asked is how much of that is available at today's prices? And the answer for that is there's two ounces available. Now I'm being facetious, but there's very, very little available at today's prices. And that's the important thing that people never, I shouldn't say never, very few people in my experience seem to understand about markets. That is that they will think back when silver goes, let's say above 30. And they'll look back at our price chart and they'll say to themselves, geez, when silver was at 22, I could have bought this much. Well, maybe yes, maybe no. The idea being that any buying pressure will start to move the price up. So how much is available at $22 an ounce is very little. How much is available at $25 an ounce? Probably a little bit more. How much is available at $50 an ounce? Well, a great deal more right now because that would be the old high. And there's people that are what we call stale longs that have held silver and bought it, you know, at 40, 45. And they're like, you know, I really don't like silver. You know, Andy Hoffman is a great guy. David Morgan sounds like he knows what he's talking about. But, but I want out. <laughs> I want out. So that's called overhead supply. Right. So we've got to work through that. Right. But the idea is very, very important. And that is that there is not very much supply at these levels. And there will be more as we move forward, but not that much. Silver right now, as bad as the price is, is extremely tightly held. Not as tightly held as I saw a few years back when I was lecturing in London. And I said in front of that audience that this is the tightest silver supply has ever been in, in my studies. And it was very interesting that I made that statement because you got to remember where I am. I'm in London, England. Where am I? Well, I'm in probably the financial capital of the Anglo-American empire. And how many fund managers were sitting there listening to me that believed me? Well, probably a few. And the price really took off from that point. Now, I'm not saying anything to do with it, and I'm just reporting the facts. Mm -hmm. But I look back on that and said, geez, that's kind of interesting. Look what happened. The point I'm making is this. It's not that tight right now, but it's tight. And the other part is the financial conditions are worse now than they were 
previous to the 2008 crisis, in my very steady view, and I know you agree with me, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but we both see the obvious. Oh, yes, I agree. <laughs> so what we really can look forward and look into is where are the Eric Sprots, where are the Stephen Spicers, which is Central Fund of Canada, where are the Nick Baraschef's Bouillon Management Group, where are uh, Eric, I forget his last name, from uh, Zurich Continental Bank, these big silver bulls. Well, they're there. They're still there. They just don't have the ability to buy at this level because there aren't premiums in the market that they have to require for them to be able to make big purchases. But it doesn't mean that they're not sitting in the background, so to speak, waiting. So it wouldn't take a lot of upward movement in the price of silver for, let's say, one, two, three, or four big funds to come in and demand 20 million ounces, 30 million ounces, 10 million ounces. And all of a sudden, this pathetically small amount that we started this conversation with about the registered category on the COMEX being pitifully small. 44 million to, ounces as of today. You know, is something that, you know, might be demanded. I mean, there's restrictions on that. And I don't want to go into it. People have probably heard other interviews that I've done, and I'm very specific on how that works. And it's very restrictive. The, the laws or the, the contract, I should say, and the laws backing it up are extremely favorable to the shorts, not to the longs. But nonetheless, the COMEX is a paper trading derivative mechanism that is really like a showcase. It's sort of like going down to your car dealer and seeing the show car in the window that's got all the lights on it and it's shining and everybody's talking about how great it looks. But try to buy that car. No, no, this is for display purposes only. And that's more or less how the COMEX works. Exactly, exactly. You know, I have to laugh, but that's a good analogy. Yeah, because... Yes, you can get metal off the COMEX, but that very seldom happens. No, no, it's perfect. Or, or going to a, you know, a runway model show and trying to buy the dress that's there. The fact is, look, 44 million ounces is nothing. They will do everything in their power to prevent people from taking that uh, supply, whether it's there or not. Uh, but I never anticipated that that's where the focal point is going to be. Look back in 2011 or 2008, somehow that COMEX inventory still stayed there while every ounce on earth was uh, seemingly sucked up. So the same thing will happen, uh, and it may, it may not be at the COMEX. In fact, I doubt it will be, but it, it's certainly the same supply shortage is, is going to happen. And, you know, as you mentioned, at $50, there'll be a lot more supply coming into the market. But, of course... Why is silver going to be fifty dollars if it's due to a two thousand eight like crisis? For all we know, as you said, people are going to say, "I'm not selling this stuff, not not with what's going on." And uh, and you also mentioned uh, the Sprats and the Spicers. Uh, I think we all know very well that both of them, particularly Eric Sprat, are waiting in the wings for those uh, closed end funds to get premiums up to five plus percent, so they could do it again. My personal theory, I've written about for years, is that the uh, the cartel has been naked shorting these uh, funds to keep the premiums down because they know that guys like Eric Sprott will continue to do deals as, as quickly as they can. And, um, you know, that's just speculation for another day. Um, two more questions I have for you. Um, I'm sure you're aware of uh, Steve St. Angelo of the SRS Rocco report. Absolutely. And I invited him to speak at this year's Silver Summit. Unfortunately, he didn't make it, but I respect his work a great deal. In fact, I had him on our members only mastermind series. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I view him from a, uh, you know, as a former financial analyst myself, I view him as the foremost in uh, Wall Street type financial analysis in silver, where he breaks apart the balance sheets and the, uh, and the costs of production. Now, his recent work uh, he basically has said the, the major miners, and again, these are primary miners, there's not many of them, uh, that their cost of production is about $25 to $28 an ounce. And of course, the smaller producers are, have, have a higher cost. And then there's the issue of that roughly uh, two-thirds of all the production is byproduct, whether it's a copper mine, a gold mine, a lead zinc mine. What is your view about, I mean, what is the cost of production? I know it's a very difficult thing because of this uh, byproduct issue. But do you agree that the 25 plus number is correct or do you have anything more specific? Yeah, well, yes. Uh, with all due respect to Stephen, I'm not arguing with him. And I think his work's great. We talk on the phone, we have a pretty good dialogue and I consider him a friend. Uh, remember, uh, you know, for what it's worth, uh, yours truly has a degree in finance and uh, my uh, junior analyst does as well. And we did a study for our members of the Morgan Report on what is the true cost. The true cost for us was about $22 an ounce, and it varies. So it's mine to mine, company to company. 
And it's the total honest to God cost. The reason I'm making that statement is that there's this, this accounting mechanism called cash cost, which is a deceiver. It's of course, according to the accounting principles, but it's very similar to the hedonic index or the CPI, the way it's figured. It's like a big number. It's like it really is, if you have any you know, knowledge at all, the idea that inflation is you know, so low and food costs are higher and you know, all that. So it's very similar. So cash cost is basically meaningless. So the total cost, 22. I'll back that up with this. I just you know, finished the Silver Summit, as you well know. Uh, Pan American, been on our list for a long time, uh, hasn't been hitting the top tier uh, best companies for quite a while. So let me make that clear. But Jeff Burns, I know Jeff quite well. I knew Jeff when he was working with Coeur d'Alene. He's the CEO of Pan American. Pan American's mission statement to be the number one primary silver producer in the world. Okay? He goes on stage and says that their cost is, I think he said, $22 an ounce. So, yeah, so Steve's right. I mean, he might be a little bit higher than us, but it's right in that range. So I'd say, you know, again, depends on the company. 22 25 that's certainly in the ballpark. Right. Okay. Well, I mean, generally speaking... Whether it's 22 or 25, the fact is no one's making money these days. And, and it's not just, as you know, the, quote, costs of production. I mean, the, the, the business of mining has gotten so much more difficult in recent years uh, with all the taxes and the government regulations and, uh, and generally, you know, the creeping higher in costs and manpower issues. As you know, mining has been decimated in the same way the, the uh, oil industry was. I worked in for many years. So it's not getting any easier. Uh, that's for sure. And uh, at these prices, I, I continue to believe that you're going to see uh, further cutbacks in, in the capex that's vital to further production, which leads me to believe, to my last question about, uh, look, if, produ if prices stay down here much longer, I mean, what do you think, uh, especially if the economy in the world stays weak and you, you don't have exactly stellar base metal uh, demand, where do you think production might go in the next couple of years of, of silver? Well, excellent question to uh, finish up the interview. Down. I mean, Pascalama, which is one of the best discoveries that was going to be produced, uh, is not. I mean, basically, Barrett's thrown in the towel. That was about a 20 million ounce per uh, year mine going up to about 30 million. And that's today, by the way, people listening. Uh, they have officially announced they're mothballing it, and I'm sure they'd love to sell it, but good luck, uh, you know, sold to you is what I'd have to say, but go on. <laughs> and now, the, where's the biggest producer? Well, berries. I mean, you know, the Chinese will tell me that they're the number one producer. I've had them tell me that. But anyway, Mexico is certainly right up there in one, two, or three every year. And now with this new tax that's been passed, everyone's sort of waiting in the wings to see what really takes place. But believe me, this will curtail the production in Mexico, especially for the ones that have lower margins. The companies that have big margins can probably stomach it and still produce at a profit, but it's going to curtail basically any new mine in Mexico. And it's certainly going to cut back uh, a great, it could could cut back uh, mines that are already produced. So you, you're, I think you're really going to see a supply squeeze, meaning, you know, this increase in silver supply that we saw over the last decade, where there was such a rush to the commodities markets. And it was not just silver, it was commodities across the board, as we all know. Silver is 70% a byproduct metal of lead, zinc, and copper mining. And that rush is, is pretty much over, in my view. So I agree with Steve St. Angel, he uses his name again, because he does do remarkable work, is that you are going to see where what I've always talked about at the top tier of the commodities markets, and that's gold and silver. Why is that? Because one, they're the only two commodities, really, that you can hold in your hand or store in a very small volume. Now, I know that uh, silver is, you know, more than 60 times uh, more volume than gold. It's actually more than that because it's not only the gold-silver ratio, gold is denser, so it's actually more like 70 times the space. But look, a laptop in pure silver is still, you know, in the thousands of dollars range. A, a, a cell phone size of pure silver is roughly a thousand bucks. It's probably less now. That was when it was around 30. But the point I'm making is, tell me, any, anyone that has a coffee table in their house, that's made out of pure silver as a multimillionaire. I mean, come on, there is not that many, it's not that, that big a volume. Not saying uh, that everyone that has you know, millions of dollars of silver, which is very few. In other words, these are the ETFs and the Eric Spross and that type of thing. 
The point I'm making is it's, it's a very low volume compared to almost any other asset. You try to put a million dollars into uh, oil or wheat or something else. So those two commodities are one, always been money, and two, can be stored basically indefinitely. You don't have you know a, an attack problem by bull weevils or anything like you have in the, some of the agricultural markets. Yeah. So that means that as this supply demand squeeze happens and there isn't a demand for much other than the basics, which means food, energy, any surplus that is coveted and wants to be protected gets forced into the gold and silver markets. And this is a part of the equation that some of us have thought about and some of us haven't. But as it becomes more and more restrictive, these will become more valuable due to the fact of what we're talking about. Right. The supply chain will not be as uh, robust as it has been over the last few years on the silver side, especially in my view. One, cost of production. We're, at, we're there at the now. The longer it stays here, the more it's going to force the smaller guys out of the business and it's going to curtail the market. I mean, it's going to contract. And then you have areas that are going to say, you know what? We're getting silver out of the ground here. It's a lot more valuable than these little pieces of paper that we get from the U.S. Treasury. You know what? We don't want to sell it, or we want to tax it, or we're going to hold it, or we're going to nationalize it. I hate to say that because I'm very favorable to mining, as you know, but I've always taught and will continue to, look, you don't belong in the mining sector at all unless you own physical first. And once you have enough physical that you're comfortable, you want to go in and you know beat the bankers and I'll help you do that. And it's not been easy the last couple of years. Let me be straightforward about that. That's your opportunity to do so. So Andy, uh, I think that's the most positive thing we have. It may sound negative to uh, the establishment, but I think silver supply is going to be curtailed. I think we've seen the peak, not because uh, of anything other than what's going on with the taxes, the demand side for uh, the base metals that have come off a great deal. Again, 70% of the supply comes from that, and it's been curtailed a great deal. So I don't, I should say a great deal, but a measurable amount. So I am more bullish now at the bottom here than I've been in a while. I truly think the bottom is in. I called the bottom at the 28th of June of this year. I think it's the bottom. Four months have gone by. So far, I'm right. I'm not addicted to being right. I would love to be right, but time will tell. Yeah, I have a hard time believing the price could get below those June lows of, uh, you know, roughly the high 18s. And and just to clarify for, for listeners, uh, David's talking about these taxes they're proposing in Mexico, uh, which is supposedly one of the more favorable mining jurisdictions. And the same goes for Quebec, uh, where they're proposing them as well. The mining business is getting more difficult just as the supply is contracting. So um, it's it's going to be very, very difficult for me to see production go anywhere but down as well in the coming years, unless the price really spikes higher. And of course, people have to realize if the price spikes higher due to a monetary crisis, there's a good chance of nationalizations and windfall taxes that only make it more difficult to produce supply. But again, that's something maybe we could talk about on a further audio blog. Uh, so uh, I'll finish here. I'll give uh, David a second to uh, just talk about his website and how to get a hold of him. But David, I really wanted to uh, to thank you. I think you you truly live up to your uh, to your moniker as the silver guru uh, every time uh, I listen to your podcast. So thank you, and uh, just for a second, tell us about your uh, your website and how to get a hold of you. Well, great. Well, let me thank you for having me again. Uh, Miles Franklin is one of the bullion dealers that I know and trust, so I'll give you that plug because I've recommended it, especially for the IRA folks out there that want a precious metals IRA. I don't know of any company that does a better, more efficient job. So back to you on that, Andy. As far as for um, the Morgan Report, the best thing to do if you want to – I'm down on subscriptions. Anyone in my industry is. So I'll just tell the truth. I'd love to see you – benefit from our work and there's a lot of what I call metals only people that do subscribe even though we do look at the mining sector we look at the metal very hard and we look at the resource sector regardless you can get a free 30-day trial just by going to the website silver-investor.com get in on our free email list once you're on that and verify that it's really you then you will get the opportunity to get the full membership for free for 30 days so I can't give you anything better than that. I mean, seeing is believing. You can get in there. You can look at all the stuff we have. I couldn't describe it probably in 20 minutes if I told you everything that we offer. 
in the members only part of the website. So that's probably the best uh, plug, excuse the blatant plug, but uh, you know, it's my life's work. Uh, it's not just me. I have two se I'm senior and a junior analyst and like five other people behind the scenes. So we had a pretty strong team doing our best and you know, believe it or not, our head and heart are in the right place. We really wanna see you succeed. We really wanna see you and your family and your friends do as well as you possibly can through what I think is the uncharted waters of a financial system gone awry. Yeah, as, as I said, uh, when I started in the fresh smell sector in 2002, I was already well aware of, of David's work. Uh, so if you're a silver file uh, or a research file, I, I highly recommend going there. I'm sure he has one of the biggest databases out there. And and uh, he mentioned that Miles Franklin is one of the best bullion dealers, and I would concur. So if you have any questions about purchasing bullion, please give us a call anytime, 800-822-8080. Well, thank you, David. Have a great weekend, and uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you.